What's going on, guys? Welcome to another episode of Eastern Current. I am uh, I'm hosting this on solo this week. Cameron Pappas is out of town for work, and uh, and I, you know I think it was just time I tried it. I was I've been nervous. I've been scared <laughs> scared to do it by myself. I'm like I can't entertain and ask enough good questions in an hour. But I think we'll do good. We got a great guest tonight, Richard Andrews. Uh, super knowledgeable, really, really great angler, really great guide, and uh, just excited to have him on here. This is episode 36. Um, if y'all didn't see on Instagram and Facebook, we're start we're going to start releasing one extra podcast um, every other week, and we're going to do it's, ca- it's kind of a goofy name, but call it the Weekend Warrior Series, where um, we're bringing on different you know guys that just get to fish on the weekends and around their busy work schedules um, that are successful in the water, and we're going to be talking to them about some of the tactics and some of the strategies that they implement to uh, take advantage of the short amount of times they've got and and how they uh, kind of how they run their routine each weekend and, and try to stay on fish. So I think it's going to be a beneficial one for for everybody, but especially for those guys that are um, just getting a few days a month to fish and uh, you know kind of picking the brains of these other guys that are that are doing the same. Um, this episode's really, really, uh, an interesting one. And it's just about such a cool fishery here in our state. And it's the, the Roanoke river, um, striper or rockfish, if you will. And, and particularly going to be talking about the lower Roanoke, um, with Richard this week and, and, uh, going from going through all of that and, and that migration of fish. And, and I don't think there's a better person to talk to, um, than Richard. So we're going to go ahead and bring him on here. And guys, if y'all can't hear me too. Oh, I got one more thing to say first, actually keep forgetting to say this the facebook group that we started so we've already got the facebook page but there's a facebook group now that you can join uh that allows everybody to interact and share pictures and share fishing reports and ask questions and and whatnot and so uh just go over and join that facebook group also share this uh this this uh broadcast on your facebook page right now if you can uh that just helps us grow our page and so um that would be huge but we're going to bring on richard here right now there you are man what's up what's going on yeah i hear you, I hear right, you. We got you, you hear yeah i got you now i, I guess okay. that was on my end but yeah yeah thanks so much for coming on you guys if y'all are uh, experiencing any technical technical difficulties on y'all's end uh just just say here in the comments but um but yeah thanks for coming on i guess we talked about redfish last time we're gonna talk about striper uh i'm always uh so jealous this time of year and want to get up there it's just a haul for me to drive up there i saw you a couple times at the ramp last year but i haven't made it up there yet this year has the fishing been pretty strong so far already? It's been a good year. We had a, um, a low flow fall, so there wasn't a lot of discharge from the river, and the fish kind of made a late arrival into the river. They started pushing in the, the lower end of the river about the second week of January, okay. and uh, which I've seen them come as early as November or early December. But So they really started moving the river about Jan, you know, second week of January, and we've been fishing them ever since. So it's, it, we were fishing in the sound, before before they really started pushing the river in big schools and and that was good too but it's, it's a little different out there than, than it is in the river yeah for sure do, do you feel like it's a it's a water temperature thing or a moon phase what do you think pushes them up in the river level water i think level? i think i think it has to do with the flow like flow. when the when the river's when the river's cranking in the fall you know it's really high and yeah. flowing hard it it pulls those fish up that river a lot faster like they're they're there sooner in the in, during the season um i mean last year we had a really we had a like a lot of flood conditions uh we had all that rain and the, the river was flowing at like thirty five thousand cfs like most of the fall and um and they were there like i went up there the, the day after thanksgiving and caught them caught them really well and we caught them good from thanksgiving right on right on through december wow. for the holidays but typically i don't really start focusing on that fishery till after christmas yeah yeah, it kind of it kind of is the beginning of my season up there, and uh, and you know, but so it's a moving target when those fish arrive every year. But um, like I said, when when the river's high, they seem to, they seem to get there earlier, and when the river's low in the fall, they seem to, sometimes they're kind of they, they kind of stall out in the sound a little bit more. Yeah, for sure. Um, so say it's day one, you know, you're you're saying you usually like to start fishing for them right after Christmas, and you you head out there. What are you looking for when you first start out? Like when you don't have any intel. And you don't know where in the river they might be. Like, what? What do you? What? How do you start? And where? Do you, how do you end up finding those fish? Well, what I do, we usually start that time of year. We're, we're usually fishing right inside the mouths of the river. So the first, you know, few miles of the river from the mouth up. Um, and what we're doing is basically fishing with our sonars. I mean, we're looking for marks on the bottom. You know, the characteristic striper marks, which are going to be usually like I have a Lawrence HDS Gen 3 12 inch unit. And uh, and I my, my on my unit the stripers mark like little balls or on just along the bottom. So if you if you mark if you see a big school they'll be stacked 
but normally they're just like a little line on the bottom, like little individual marks. And when you see that, uh, that's usually stripers, and we, you know, we'll throw on them and, and jig, you know, bounce our jigs off the bottom and and just try them. But there's also so many gar in that lower section of the river, and there's also some, you know, catfish and stuff like that. Yeah. Big schools of blue blue cats and sure. huge schools of, of just thousands of gar, and so. There's a lot of junk that can clutter up your screen, so you kind of have to know what you're looking at, uh, and that takes a, that takes a little bit of practice. But you know, like that that fishery, the first time I ever I ever went up there in my life was when I first my first the first year I started my guide service. I went up there. We were right inside the mouth of the Kashai River, and I caught 146. <laughs> 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 and I was, sold and i didn't know how to mark them or anything we, back then we just kind of poked around and, and cast it and you know just fish fish our way through the channel until and we get one bite we'd say oh well maybe that one bite's going to turn into another bite and 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 we just kind of pinpoint it that way but now we've gotten so good using our sonars that we just we just kind of ride around and look for the mark the right kind of mark and then when we see it we, we try them. yeah and for sure so, so so a lot of times we won't even fish until we've marked some yeah do you ever, uh, you ever in the morning when you're a little tired, you're not ready to start rigging up, you kind of just idle around where you know they're not for a little bit, and you're like, oh, here they are. All right, we can start fishing now. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Well, they're, they're usually in fairly predictable spots. Um, you know, but I've got more spots that I've caught them out there than I could even fish in a week now. So I, I kind of I get a little lethargic, like, about finding new places because I've got so many good spots now. So I just ride around and kind of hit the best spots and – you know, if I don't find them there, I start hitting, you know, some of the other spots that I know, and eventually I run into them somewhere. For sure. But it is it is fun to find them in a new spot, um, and they're they're fairly predictable on what kind of spots they like to be in. I mean, they like, you know, they like um, they like le- channel ledges for sure. They'll get on the, you know, where the where the where the flats come off the bank and then drop down into the channel. They'll get on the side ledges. They'll also get in certain sections of the river where it's, there's not too much. Uh, like you'll have like a nice long straightaway where it's not too deep, maybe like fifteen to twenty feet deep. They'll they'll just get right in the middle of the channel in places like that. Yeah. And then you'll have places where where there's curves in the river where they'll 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 get on little depth changes in the channel. You know where it might drop from like twelve to like thirty feet over the course of fifty yards, and they'll get on that ledge. Um, you know, at, at the bottom of the channel itself, not on the sides but in the bottom. And and they might be sitting in a spot that's no bigger than your boat. Wow. So so it's, so it's a challenge. You mark them. And you're like, okay, well, I got to figure out how to get to this fish. Like so, I'll, what I'll do is I'll mark them. And in some places, the current might be so fast that we have to just sit on top of them and kind of vertical jig them. Uh-huh. But I, I don't like to do that because it's not as fun. You know, I like to get off of the fish and make a cast to them. And I'll tell my client, say, look, you know, the the fish are right there off that tree right there. But you need to cast upstream about 20, 30 yards because it's about 25 feet deep there. You're going to have to let your your bait sink down in the current, you know. So so by the time it hits the bottom, it's going to be where the fish are. Yeah, yeah. Does that make sense? Definitely. What's going on, guys? Sorry about that. We had a little internet difficulty. This is uh this is history for us. This is the first time. So hey, if y'all were here for it, congrats. I- <laughs> I live I live in the middle of nowhere and I got terrible internet service so that's what it is. We're gonna blame it on you, man. You're never coming back on here. You're ruining us. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, so I I lost you for probably the last minute of what you were okay. saying. So uh, you were talking about I, the last thing I remember you saying was talking about uh, kind of where you're having your clients cast if the fish are sitting on a tree and they're casting up current 25 feet or so. Okay, so it's just it's really just a matter of like marking those, learning how to see them on the on the sonar mark them and then kind of position your boat off of the fish and then casting to them you know finding the angle that will work in the current sometimes you might have to sit on top of them and vertical jig them if the current's super super fast or you know if the current's not too bad you can get off of them and make a make a full cast to them which is a whole lot more fun to catch them kind of at the end of your cast versus right under the boat you know yeah but um but so that's essentially how we do it um and casting angle is really important, and typically those fish in the winter are going to be on the bottom. So if you don't have bottom contact, you're really most of the time not going to get a bite unless you're in a huge school that you know where they're layered and suspended above the bottom. But a lot of times these are smaller smaller groups of fish. 
um, that are right on the bottom. So it's crucial to have bottom contact, and, and that's easier said than done. I mean, I get a lot of experienced fishermen on my boat. You know, you have to keep a super tight line throughout your cast. You know, you have to you have to pop that jig and then let it drop with a tight line and make sure that that you don't have much slack, so you can feel that little tick. Yeah. And they don't, you know, when the water temperature gets gets real low, like in the low 40s, and I've caught them when the water temperature has been in the high 30s, you won't even hardly feel a bite. They'll just pick it up. Yeah. So you have to be, you have to have that line tight. You know, you're fishing in, tw- you know, sometimes 20, 25, 30 feet of water, heavy current with a tight line, trying to get that little bite on the drop. And so it, so it's 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 uh it's fun, but yet it's challenging. Definitely. That yeah, I'm with you. That's it is a very fun. It's like high speed speckled trout fishing from like where I am in Wilmington. Like you're fishing that current, but in some of that stuff in the rivers, you know, faster and deeper. But it's so satisfying. Like, I, I, and you see it with clients. Like, because I get to fish that river with you a little bit in Weldon. Uh, as clients learn it, and you know, it, it's kind of tricky for them at first, and all of a sudden they start to understand the swing and kind of where to cast and how to hold their rod. And um, once yeah. it, it seems like a lot, but once you figure it out, it's actually pretty simple. And like the the bait kind of does everything itself besides your little pops. Um, yeah so that, that's super cool um so we, yeah we talked about kind of where you start if, uh beginning of the season so let's talk about a little bit um kind of where you're looking to target these fish like what what kind of stuff are you looking for in the river um what do these fish like to hold on and, and all that well the bet the more you can kind of build like a three-dimensional picture of the bottom of the river in your head the better off you're going to be um those fish can either be at the bottom of the channel or they can be on at, on the side of the river channel. Uh, so and it, they can even be up on the flats near the bank. Yeah. We caught we we catch them in certain situations like that as well. Typically, not so much when it's real cold that they like to be down deep. But um, you know, any channel ledge is a candidate. Um, curvy sections of river often have more ledges because mm-hmm. you've got a pool. Usually, have a pool on the outside of your your the bend, a deep pool, and you know you've got you, I mean, these, this river has the same features as any mountain stream would have that you can actually see, but they're just less apparent. I mean, you've got all the features like point bars and pools and riffles and, you know, what they call a run and a glide where, you know, you, you go from the straight, you know, the straight sections of the river are typically very sh- sh- more shallow. Yeah. Then, you, then, you, then you hit a curve, so you're going to go from maybe 15-foot straight section into like a 30-foot pool. And then you'll come around a curve and you'll come out of the pool to another straight section um, where it might it'll shallow up again. So th- those types of things, in a, in a typical pool of a river, you're going to have three ledges. You're going to have a ledge going going from upriver, da- downriver into the pool. You're going to have a ledge coming out of the pool. And you're going to have a ledge coming from the inside of the curve to the outside of the curve. You know, where the point bar, you know, you've got a point bar with that's a depositional area on the inside of a curve. That's that's why you see sandbars on the inside of curves and rivers in the coastal plain. And then you've got the pool on the outside of the curve. So you've got a big depth change there. We catch them a lot on on all those ledges I just mentioned. Yeah. So so all these like super nerdy like river you know river features that are, are very much come into play in the coastal plain, but For you sure. just can't see them as well. Very, you know, you, you sit in a, you, 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 I mean, like when I went, I went to graduate school for natural resources and I took a bunch of, uh, uh, river morphology courses, like in, in ecology courses. And we yeah. studied this kind of stuff. So I, so I actually have like a technical background in some of this stuff. And it's pretty cool to apply some of the stuff I learned by reading books and studying rivers to by fishing. Yeah. So that's, that's why I love to fish. Like, like that's why I like. I, I really, honestly, prefer to fish like flowing rivers more than I like fishing estuaries where it's shallow. And there's not not these not these features we're talking about. So, it's but these fish are very predictable if you understand how rivers work. And the more you the more you kind of you know, like I said, develop maybe a three a three dimensional map of the bottom of the river, the better off you're going to understand where these fish want to sit. Yeah, definitely. Not just looking at the bank and and what you can see outside of the river. Really trying to understand what's what's on the bottom. I think you might be one of the only fishing guides that kind of has a degree to be a fishing guide, then, is what it sounds like you're saying, unless you're a marine <laughs> biology major. <laughs> well, well, we were studying we were studying rivers to, like, restore r- really degraded rivers, so we were studying all these features 
and learning how to identify features of rivers that needed fixing. That's that's what I got my degree in ecological restoration. So so uh, it's um it, it's been pretty fun to kind of use some of my some stuff I learned in school for my job. Yeah. Which sure. which you really being a fishing guy, there's really nothing there's really nothing they teach in school that'll teach you how to how to be a fishing guy. <laughs> but anyway. No, maybe it's just kind of school. It's like really that. just school of hard. <laughs> school of hard knocks. It's really just a school school of, school of hard knocks. Yeah. <laughs> school of boat paint so and any, broken boat letters. <laughs> So, <laughs> but um, school of hard knocks and lo- lots, lots of time, lots of time and inclement weather. Yeah, for sure. Well, weather, that's, that was going to be my next question. So we talked a little about, about like the time of year and the temperature, but, but weather wise and con- what other like, you know, external conditions play into a good day or a bad day and, and kind of like, uh, what you're looking for, uh, for a good day of fishing there. Well, weather for these for these fish weather is fairly in my opinion fairly irrelevant um okay. i mean if anything the cold the colder it gets the, the colder the water temperature gets the bigger schools that i typically find like when it the warmer it is the warmer the water temperature is the more scattered these fish tend to be and they tend to be break apart and they're in smaller schools like some of the biggest schools i've ever found have been when the water temperature is down in the low 40s and high 30s when it, you know after a really really big cold streak for a week or two um so water temperature for these winter stripers is really not all that important in my opinion um what is the most important factor the single most important factor is the current in the river okay so so down in the lower end of the Roanoke and, and all of our rivers the lower noose the lower tar <clears throat> you've got a certain certain portion of that river which flows from upstream to downstream and then it hits it hits it hits a point usually the the, the last maybe 10 15 miles of a river or so where it kind of turns into this wind tidal system so you get this hard easterly wind or blowing you know blowing off the sound and it, and it will actually back the water up like i've fished the mouth of the roanoke before and the current's actually been going upstream wow but, but you can ride you can get in your boat and ride five or ten miles up up river and it's, it's going to be flowing from upstream to downstream constantly so what what that does is when that when that current backs up and slows down the fish just don't bite as well they don't school and they don't bite as well they just simply don't feed as aggressively um when you have a westerly wind like let's say let's say you have like a a bunch of cold fronts like we typically have in the winter you know where the wind switches to the west and northwest and you get this cold dry air mass that we yeah. get you know call them alberta clippers or whatever usually in the winter we get a couple of those a week so we get a lot of west northwest wind and in the rolling oak, that gets the water flowing hard it gets it sucking out and that's exactly what we want we want that current pulling as hard as it can go out down river out and out out the mouth so easter a lot of east wind a lot of light south or whatever we've had we've had a lot of that this year we've had a lot of northeast and we've had a lot of warm weather warm wet weather so we haven't had that dry cold you know westerly wind that we normally have so it's it's slack it's made current kind of slack a lot of days which has made the fishing tougher in certain a certain occasion yeah uh, so really it's it the biggest the biggest the biggest factor is the current but i guess to answer your question the current is kind of tied into the weather yep, somewhat definitely, so because it's because it's kind of it's cause, so it kind of depends on what the wind's doing you know it's just kind of pushing that water around different directions do you feel like uh like overcast or sunny days are better or does it not really matter i don't really think it matters at all i, I fish I, I, most of my trips are six hour trips we start at nine and end at three and uh and the best fishing is usually right in the middle of the day when it's warm really warm and sunny yeah, I, I like it warm and sunny. I really do. Do you feel like Especially, later on in the year, as as they transition further up river and it gets warmer, that the condi- like con- like the weather conditions play more of a factor? Or is it still about the same? Um, it it just really it's more to me. It's just most important to have the right conditions. Yeah, the flow. and you know with, with the sense. with the current and then and then um just be just be able to find the fish. You know, they'll buy they'll buy any time of day. Uh, but you know there are exceptions to the rule. There's times when the when the fish kind of seem to bite better in the morning or late in the afternoon. I mean, you, you see that in Weldon for sure, don't you? I mean, it, yeah, I feel like Weldon, I see it in Weldon. And the water temperature is not that higher, that not, not that much higher up there than it is in some instances down the lower end of the winter. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, but for the most part, 
I don't think it really matters. I just think most most importantly find the fish. And um, but I have seen it where I marked tons of stripers. I knew they were stripers, and we didn't have the current, you know, pulling hard enough, and they just simply wouldn't bite. Yeah. I mean, they. I mean, they. They do. They're. They're. They. They can not. They do get to where they won't bite sometimes, and that. That's aggravating. Uh, and and the, the more I fish for them, the more I see that, and the more I'm a believer in that. I used to say that stripers were so opportunistic that it, it was just a matter of finding them and you catch them, you know, automatically. But that's not the case. They. 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 they sometimes they shut off as well. Yeah. Uh, I will say up in Weldon sometimes when they start releasing a little bit more water up there out of that dam. It can get mm-hmm. like I feel like that's when I see the best bite up there. Like you're saying, like there's there's good flow, and all of a sudden the flow ups a little bit, and it's like those fish just start going nuts. Yeah, I, th- I mean fluctuating water sometimes can can be challenging. I feel like, yeah. but when, when it, ri- it rises and, it, and it's stable, um, it's you know once it stabilizes, that that's fine. That, that can really turn them on, like you said. Yeah. But I, I think when it when it's coming up hard or when it's falling out hard. It can it can definitely turn the bite off. Turn the bite off. I've seen. Yeah. 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 Oh, cool. Well, um, I, I, so Richard, you guys, he wrote an article, um, and it's on. His, is it on your website yet? Yeah, I posted it on my website. Cool. So it's it's on his website. You can find it there. That's tarpamguide.com, correct? Yeah, that's right. And then you cannot. You'll also be able to find it on Eastern Current. So he goes into a lot of uh, in depth on a lot of the stuff through this article, and y'all can check that out. Um, especially if y'all miss some of it from the the. This, what happened earlier with the technical difficulties, but in that you mentioned a, a lot about the uh, you know the black the blackwater creeks and stuff like that, that that came in down there in the Lower Roanoke. You want to touch on on those areas as far as uh, stuff that holds fish? Yeah, I mean there's a there's a lot of I mean there's a lot of water down there. There's there's a ton of water just in the main river channel, but there's also a ton of water in the tributaries, and we do a lot of fish in the tributaries and. In certain times, certain conditions, that the trips can, can can be very productive. So uh, don't discount the the creeks. Um, they're they're always worth exploring, particularly when the current's pulling good. Uh, there's a lot of a uh, lot of flooded, swampy areas down there, and and the fish sometimes will school along the banks with where there's water coming out of the banks, and that's always a very productive pattern. Um, but you have to have the current to to have that situation occur. Yeah, they're not going to go up in anything without current, I guess, right? Yeah, they're just going to, without the current, they're just going to kind of fall back off the banks. They're going to sit down, they're going to scatter, and they're going to sit down in like, you know, heavy structure where it's hard to hard to fish for them. Yeah. <laughs> you know, with the current, with the current, they're going to get more. They're going to get up on those banks. They're going to get suspended. They're going to be feeding. They're going to get schooled up. So it, it really, I mean, I mean, I can almost look at the conditions before I even start my trip and tell what my day's going to be like. Yeah. You know, so, some days I know it's going to be a tough day before I even go. Or other days I'm like, I'm, I, I get, I get, get real, real jacked up. And I'm like, man, man, this is going to be a heck of a day. Cause they're just going to be chewing their butts off. And we're, yeah. we're, we're going to catch 100, 150 fish today, no problem. Uh, so, but it's it's just a crapshoot. I mean, you book a trap and you come and, and conditions might be like that or they might be tough. You know, yeah. it's just it's fishing. Yeah, that's any fishing for sure. One question I wanted to ask earlier when we were kind of getting that technical difficulties is you said you fish so much off of your uh, your fish finder. Is there a specific type of trend? Are you running any side scan or anything like that? Or are you just fishing traditional down scan? What what are you what are you doing on your depth finder to help you find those fish? Your fish finder. Well, I, I have a size I have side scan on my unit, um, but I don't use it as much as the down, down scan. I, mean, I use use the high def, the high definition down scan a lot, and a lot of times when I'm running. Running up and down the river, I'll have it on the 2D sonar because it seems like you can mark fish better when you're running with that. Okay. So sometimes you run over them. You run over them while you're running. Like you might be going 25 miles an hour, or 30 miles an hour up the river, and you're like, "Oh, there's a scratch on my screen." And you, you stop and turn around, and bam, there they are. Yeah. So that that's always helpful to keep your 2D, your regular traditional sonar on when you're running, because you can actually run over a mark like that. Definitely. Are you running? A, or do you have a through hole transducer? Or do you have one hanging off the back for that? No, I have I have that long uh, structure scan transducer gotcha. that Lawrence makes. That's what I have off the, off the transom. Cool deal. Yeah, but I, but I always tell people, I mean, it, it's it's good to know how to use your use your electronics, but don't. You know, use your brain first. Like, use your brain and say, okay, where are these, where, where were these fish? You know, where will these fish likely be? And, and ask yourself those kinds of questions. And then you can use your, your electronics as a verification tool. Don't, don't, just don't get too dependent on. Them. 
Yeah, I was having that discussion yesterday with somebody. I, I went bass fishing, kayak kayak fishing out of a bat or bass fishing out of a kayak, and uh, it was my buddy's spare kayak, and he's got GPS units on it, and we were we were fishing deep water, and I was I mean I, I don't do a ton of fishing with my GPS because I do a lot of shallow fishing and. It's so easy to very quickly get super tied into like, oh, if I'm not seeing exactly what what I want to see, I'm moving or I'm, you know, when still I caught a couple of fish yesterday too, where I wasn't marking any fish, but I was still fishing that area. You know, you you can't always trust the units, but they're pretty good. They're pretty good nowadays. Yeah, that's that's a good rule of thumb for any kind of fishing. But I tell I tell people, you know, you know, when 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 they're on the boat, I'm like, yeah, they can run from this thing, but they can't hide. We'll see, but we'll see them. You know, we'll we'll see them on the bottom some. Like, and, and you know, I, I'll get a little scratchy mark where I like I might see like eight or ten fish. I'm like, oh, that's just a small school. We'll catch a few here, and we turn around and start casting on this like, you know, forty, fifty fish. I'm like, wow, that's a lot more fish there than I thought. And and and, yeah. and then the exact opposite happens. Like, I'll get a he- I'll get a huge mark and be like, oh my gosh, this is mud low. We're gonna catch like a hundred, and we'll catch like five. Yeah, you know, out of that yeah. school. So maybe they just weren't biting. Maybe it, maybe it wasn't all strikers. You know, there's a lot of variables. But um, but anyway, yeah, that's that's kind of you know that's as as I've gotten better with my you know using my sonar, I've gotten more dependent on it. But I try not to depend on it completely. For sure. Well, once you find them with the sonar and you're going to fish for them, let's go through a little bit, kind of you know what people can do, um, you know, lure and bait wise to to target these fish. What do you like to throw? Well, so. Um, I've always been a Z-Man guy. I started using them out of the, when I first started fishing up there, and they've always been very effective baits. Uh, so, I mean, you can catch them on a lot of different stuff, but there's no there's so many fish up there. There's really no reason to use anything but a, a jig head and a, and a plastic. Yeah. So I use you probably probably ninety eighty percent of the time I use a half ounce jig head with some sort of you know Z-Man plastic. Okay. Sometimes we use three eighths in certain scenarios when the current's not not running as fast, or if we're fishing shallower. Um, and I'll use a variety of different soft plastics, mostly swim baits. I mean, I'll, I'll use some as big as this. This is the um, the seven inch diesel that they just came out oh, yeah. with. Bait. Um, we use those. Uh, we use the uh, the five inch diesels a lot. That's a good swim bait. It catches a lot of fish. Uh, and of course the old standby, that's where I got started right there. The old three inch minnow, I mean, that'll catch any fish anywhere in the world right there. <laughs> I mean, that's a good, that's, that's a, that's a hard one to beat. Yeah. And then, and then, but I, but I, you know, as I've evolved more, I've fished, I also fish a lot of jerk baits, you know, we'll fish, we'll fish a lot of the five inch streaks. Uh, and we'll fish, uh, can everybody see that? Can everybody see these labels on there? Uh, hold it up a little bit higher. You're a little blurry right now, but, but if you hold it up a little bit higher, you'll see it. Yeah, okay. Um, a little okay, bit well, higher. That's the, like that's the, the five. Boom. Nailed it right there. Yeah. That's the five inch streak. And we use a lot of the scented, the five inch scented jerk shads as well. Sweet. Yep. So that's really, that's really all I use. And, um, and we keep it pretty simple with the colors. You know, there's old saying like white or chartreuse for stripers. You know, white chartreuse, pink, uh, a combination of those sometimes will work. Um, you know, sometimes if we're fishing a little bit more clear water, black water, we might use some some of the natural colors like smoky shad or smelt or you know somewhere something along those lines uh, like the pearl, the pearl blue glimmer. That's a, you know, that's kind of what I would call I love a that natural that natural color. So white, chartreuse, pink, some of the natural colors. Keep it simple. I mean, you can really. I think I fished an entire season up there with nothing but like one of the first years I got it up there. I was using nothing but that bait right there with a half ounce jig head and white or chartreuse the entire season. <laughs> that's and and we caught awesome. several thousand several thousand stripers. Yeah. But no, as far as the jig head. They'll easy, man. Um, but as far as the baits go, um, or jig heads go, we use. Um, I got a guy that pours these for me. He's in Kenley, big head jig heads. Paul Summerlin, he's a good friend of mine. He's fished with me a bunch. If you want to get hooked up with some of these, just give Paul a call. This is a half ounce jig head with a double bar. Can you see that? Yeah, I can see is that. It, is it, a camera, it's a little is a camera blurry, that? Man, but but you can see it. You okay. Can see it, yeah. It's got a four-aught mustad hook, 
And, you know, it's kind of like the trout eye dick has that they sell. It's got the double barb. Yeah. That double barb is key, key having the barb on both sides of the shank because that way you don't have to glue the baits. You know, they, that the last tech will actually stay up there. If you, 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 you rig it and kind of overshove it up there, it'll stay up there on that bar really well. And it'll seat on there just perfectly. And you don't have to touch it. You know, that, a, bait, a, fish, a fish has got to rip that hard in order to rip that down. It won't, it won't rip off. So, yeah, sure. so I, use, I use that when I'm using conventional jig heads. Uh, we're working with Z-Man right now to try to get some of these uh, weedless jig heads poured in half ounce. Right now they offer this is the, uh, if you can see that, this is the, uh, this is called the TT Snake Locks jig head. Okay. It's a weedless head. Um, it's, this is a, uh, a three alt hook right here. They make it in three alt, four alt, and five alt. And uh, it's just a weedless, you know, worm hook basically, but it's got a little little notch there that holds the bait on. Oh, yeah, that's sweet. Um, let me see if I can get unrig this, and I'll show you the, the raw jig head. We started using a lot of these because we do get hung up so much. See, there's your, there's your weedless jig head, that, the, the snake locks. That's, yeah. that's a cool jig head. Yeah, it's got, it's got an artic it articulates it's pretty sweet so it's got a good action to it uh we started using those with a lot of the swim baits and the jerk baits uh like the three alt really works well for the the uh, four inch diesels um I, I do use the four inch i didn't i didn't grab a pack of the four inch but i use those as well that's like the perfect fit for a, a four inch diesel and you can upsize it for the fives and the sevens but, uh, but that helps us, you know, we're fishing in, he in heavier spots and, you know, there's a, lot, there's a lot of cover that helps us stay, not lose so many baits. Yeah. So, so going weedless with a heavier jig head like that is definitely a, 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 something we started doing a lot more and it works well. And the hookup ratio is just, is, with that jig head, is fine. Yeah. You know, it's not, not, not much less than a regular jig head. Yeah. But I'll, I'll have days, I'll have days if I don't go weedless where it's depending on where we're fishing, I might lose 30 or 40 baits in a trip. Yeah. And that's just that, that's just the way that the way it is there you know you're fishing a river with a lot of soft wood everywhere and so you just make sure you carry a bunch of baits with you and a bunch of jig heads if you plan on putting in a full day of fishing up there yeah that someone just asked actually you answered the question john taylor he said how many jig heads do y'all lose in a day up there that's pretty uh so so do you feel like, what do you feel like the ratio is if you switch over to weedless if you're throwing a weedless bait do, do you'll, you, you'll 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 still lose a few, but you will you will lose a whole lot less, yeah. a whole lot less. Yeah. So we're so we're, we're I'm working with Z-Man right now to try to get them to pour that head in a, in a half ounce, which is going to be a little bit more productive in, in heavier current scenarios. So keep an eye out for that. It'll it should be out soon. Um, awesome. That, but that's def, yes, yeah, that's, that's definitely a great consideration. But I have to answer his question again. I've had has, I've had some days where I've lost probably 50 or 60 baits. In a day, in one, in, in one day, and it depends on my anglers too. If I got anglers that can't cast quite accurately, and they're throwing a lot of baits in the trees, the tree limbs, and that sort of thing, then you know it adds to it. But just getting snagged, yeah, you could lose twenty, thirty baits out there. Will you stick with those jig heads pretty heavy? Um, if uh, if you got guys that are throwing in and it's losing a bunch, or do you do you have some uh, some stowaways in there that are a little bit cheaper you'll tie on? No, I, I I I stick with what I, I stick with those the ones that are poured by my friend Paul. Um, he you know I get them a good good price and um, I, I order about eight hundred a year. So so I I don't I don't run out. I got I got I got tons of them. <laughs> for sure. I uh, last year in Weldon when I was coming up there, um, you know I, I I had to guide that day. I was leaving and I didn't pack beforehand and. I got up there and realized that I didn't bring any jig heads or weedless hooks or anything like that. But my buddies, my buddy had just ordered a bunch of stuff from iStrike strike that was in my truck that I hadn't, hadn't given to him yet. And, uh, I just fished all his stuff and lost all his new jig heads. <laughs> so man, jig heads later in the season at Weldon, jig heads become a hot commodity. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. You could, you could <laughs> trade them for beers or, uh, food or anything. Yeah. You need yeah <laughs> that's funny no they really don't. yeah i would love to go up there though when the river's super low i mean you could get all the jig heads you need for years up there and well oh, i'm sure there i'm sure that i know there's a local there's somebody up there a local guy who who probably does that every year and he he probably brags to all his friends about all the jig heads he gets for free it probably, it probably, it probably sells them to all his fishing buddies yeah you know? for real, for real. <laughs> that's awesome um, yeah. So, is there a time you're talking about the streaks and the and the paddle tails like the diesel minnows? Is there 
you know, are there different scenarios in which you're going to throw, or are you just kind of like whatever, trying different stuff? No, I, uh, if I'm just fishing like the channel bottom or the channel ledges themselves, like, you know, 15 to 25 feet of water, I'm usually going to throw one of those, those soft plastic dirt baits, okay. the streaks or the, or the, or the scented, uh, dirt baits. Um, if I'm going to be throwing closer to the bank, um, to where I'm going to be bringing it off a flat or even off a bank ledge, I'm usually going to be throwing a, a, a swim bait. Okay. So they, t- they tend, they tend to be, they tend to be a little more effective in those situations. You can kind of, you can kind of just swim them. You know, keep them suspended above the bottom and swim them out. And then once they kind of come out in the deeper water, you can kind of let them drop and then start jigging them too. Yeah. So it's almost like two casts, two, two different presentations in one cast. You know, you're throwing up into the trees or, or into the bank, swimming the bait out in, in, you know, two or three foot depths. And then when, as it comes off the bank and it gets into seven or eight, ten feet of water, you can start letting it drop. And then you can start your jigging, you know, technique back to the boat. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, but, but, but sometimes, like, if we're fishing in the middle of the river or uh, down towards the mouth of the river where we're, we're not fishing the bank as much, we I'll just use the, the soft plastic dirt baits, and we're just bouncing the bottom of them. Cool. So here's they can, they, oh, sorry about that. The, the Skype lags. Right, not going um, we got a bunch of people that watch that, that don't have boats and, and you know, they, they fish on foot a little bit. Um, is there areas to do that there that you can be successful? Are there some docks you can go hit and, and, and try to target those fish on foot? Well, the wildlife uh, wildlife folks have built docks at the, ro- at the boat ramps. There's one in, there's one in uh, Williamson. There's one at um, in Janesville. Uh, but really the accessibility of that area is, is by, mostly by boat because you've got these – flooded swamps you know that are adjacent to the river and you can't you really can't get out to them i mean you know they're just they're, they're hard it's hard to get out to the main river channel some places yeah definitely um do you i mean I, I feel like in years past we've had such high um you know high water and and dealing with like you know the trees being flooded and everything do you ever find fish way back up in that flooded stuff like up in the trees or are you still mostly trying to stick to the um the river the main river well when the when the river when the river floods uh, it gets real high like it is right right, right now it's flowing at 35,000 they're, they're just starting to drop it this week like by friday it's going to be flowing at 10,000 cfs so that's a pretty significant drop um but when it's up at 35,000 it's it's max normal flow rate like when they just have to push a ton of water through the dams, you know, they get a ton of water that comes down in the car lake from Virginia and they have to just push it off through real fast. They'll, they'll run at 35 for a set period of time. They've been running at 35 for about a week now. And when it got up to 35, it, should, it gets so high that the fish simply, a lot of the fish just swim out of the channels and up into the swamps. Like they yeah. get into the trees and you really can't target them in places like that. Like you can fish them on the banks, but you know, when they get all spread out in the trees, man, they're like, they're like, they might be a mile from the river channel back in a swamp somewhere feeding on some, in some culvert going through a road crossing or something like that. I mean, that, yeah. they're looking for, they're looking for heavy currents areas where water's ripping through the swamp where they can just gorge themselves on forage like crawfish. They eat a lot of crawfish in the wintertime. Uh-huh. Um, so, that, so those fish are just like bass. When it floods, they go right into the swamps. Yeah, that's and right. and they and, and you'll, you'll you'll notice that in the river channel they start thinning out a lot. Yeah, that's uh. Yeah, so that's a lot of times it's best. Lot, lot, so a lot of times the fishing's best when the water starts to rise. You know, it's just starting to flood. But when it gets real high, like when it's like two or three or four feet deep in the trees, then then the fishing starts to go downhill. And then when they drop the water again, you know that can be really good. Like I'm I'm anticipating some really good fishing this week. Like we had really good fishing when the water came up. It was it was at about I can't remember what it was before they, before it came up. It was about fifteen thousand or something for there for a while, and then it came up to thirty five, and now they're going to drop it to ten here at the end of the week. So it was, it was awesome fishing when the water went from fifteen to thirty five. You know, it took it takes a few days for that to happen too. Right. It just doesn't happen. It doesn't happen overnight, especially on the lower end, because when all that water comes down that river channel from from you know Scotland Neck, Hamilton, that area. It, once it gets to Williamson, it really, and even even above that, it starts to spread out in the floodplain. So it takes it takes a while for that that level to really get up, and then conversely, when they drop it, it takes a long time for the water to get down. So we're going to have we're going to have falling water conditions for the next couple of weeks probably. Cool. And that's going to be 
I'm going to be really stoked about that. That's going to be fun. Like, we're, might, it's going to be some good fishing. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah that's when you need to come. So, 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 so we're on, you know, we had good fishing when it was rising, then it got real high, and the fishing kind of dwindled down a little bit because the fish got so scattered, and now, now the water's about to drop out again, it's going to get really good again. Good. So, Sweet. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. So every, every, everything is, is, um, is dictated by what that river's doing. Okay. I mean that, that 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 is the single biggest fa- biggest factor that affects these fish's behavior is the current in the river, the level of the river, all that. It's just it's it's gotten. It, I'm I'm fortunate because I'm out there six days a week and I can see the patterns and see how it affects you know where the fish are, what they're doing, but uh, but it really that is it. That's this, the river drives everything. I gotcha. Well, let, let's talk a little bit about this migration of fish so people kind of understand what's going on like these fish are coming into this river to spawn um and you said you know they really they they come in mostly due to flows and and water temperature doesn't matter so much but um one thing you said to me that was really interesting as well that i didn't i didn't know is that you said you you were saying you can almost catch them all up and down the river right now it's not like they're all in one spot um well they yeah they they use this river as an extension of the sound of the feeding ground so they they run this river they run all up and down this river everywhere like they're not just like like some people think that like they come in to the mouth of the river in the winter in this big school and they kind of work their way up the river gradually when it's time to and when it's time to spawn like they're right there in love them you know they kind of time their migration to whether you know early april mid-april they're they're right there on their spawning grounds where they're supposed to be. Yeah. That, that, I, I don't, I don't, I don't believe in that whatsoever. I think these fish, they they use the Roanoke River and they use other tributaries of Albemarle Sound as as feeding grounds all winter long. And so I, I know that for a fact because I, we tagged the fish. I did. I had a client from from Long Island who liked to do. Um, and he did his own independent tagging, and that was his hobby was to tag striped bass. So we ta- we probably put several hundred tags out ourselves. And we tagged the fish in at the mouth of the Rona in February, and we got a return from that fish one month later in the Scuppernong River in Columbia. What? So those the, these fish are going all they're all they're going all different directions. They're not just they're not just, they're not just gradually meandering up the Rona River, and and lo and behold, second week of April they're there to spawn. That it, they don't, it doesn't work like that. They they'll go up back up back. I mean they're just they're just roaming everywhere. And they, a lot of people don't realize how much they they move. I mean, they are they're tremendous, tremendous swimmers. And I mean, I, I don't catch a lot, a lot a lot of days. I don't catch these fish in the same spot every day. They they're I'll go and burn them down in one spot one day and go right back there the next day thinking I'm gonna find them again. They're gone. And I, and it, so it's very it's very it's very unpredictable. I mean, but but if you know what you're looking for, if you if you, if you can find places. That they're likely to be to feed, and then it makes it somewhat more predictable. But but they're oftentimes not in the same spot every day, and yeah. it and it's it's aggravating. But it makes I guess it makes my services a little bit more marketable in a way. But uh, but it's it, it, it's tricky. I mean, it really is. Like I, I think I had a day where I caught 120 one day a few weeks ago, and I and I retraced my steps the next day to a T. I went to every place that I caught them the day before, and we caught like thirty the next day. Really? Yep. I that, mean, that's the crazy yeah. thing about that river, though, too. And it's you know, it, everything's relative. But a thirty fish day is still such a strong day. You know, I mean, well, not, we'll not see, when well, you know what it could be, but but yeah. still, for most people coming and catching thirty fish, that's pretty awesome. Well, the hard that's one of the hardest parts of my job is to stay positive and and really keep keep grinding it out on a day when i know it's not going to be that good we don't have the conditions i want but i mean a 20 30 40 fish day i mean that's the beauty of that fishery and that's one of the, one of its greatest attributes is that even when it's not great you can still catch 20 30 40 fish yeah that's a yeah. that's a slow day and so and, and, and to many many people who've never experienced that fishery that's a great experience definitely and um and I mean, we 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 might have just a few days all season where we'll catch like less than twenty fish. Yeah. I mean, I can probably I can probably put on one hand how many days you know the whole winter season that we catch less than twenty fish. And those days, a lot of times, it's, it's we probably could catch more if I just stayed 
in an area and grinding it out, you know, for like really, really scattered bites. But I, the way I fish, I'm just, I'm looking for that mother load. I'm looking for that big school. So we're probably spending more time than we should running and gunning and looking for that big school. Instead, we could have stayed in one area and yeah. maybe just caught them real, real scattered and probably even done better than that. Yeah, definitely. So. Definitely. Um, do you feel like uh, there is a, a better time of year to fish for these fish? Like is winter the best time? Is spring the best time? Or is it, I, you know, pretty consistent all the way through? I mean, I mean, it can be awesome in March. It can be awesome in April. Uh, even even during w- the times that we're in Weldon in April, it can really be good on the lower end. Like, not all those fish go to Weldon. They st- some of them stay on the lower end. Um, but in general, the best fishing year in and year out is in January and February. Okay. In early in, er- in early March, it seems like when the when the water temperature starts to climb up into the mid fifties. Uh, you know, really get, you're getting that springtime temperature rise like you see everywhere. Yep. Kind of that, that permanent rise, you know, not, not a fluctuation where it rises and goes back down. You get a big cold front. I'm talking about like the mid-March rise. Usually those fish start to move a lot more and they get to be let, they're a little bit less predictable. Okay. So they're, they're, they're moving around, they're breaking apart. They're not as big enough, as big of groups. But the exception to that is if you have like super good conditions and water levels, I mean, they can be it can be phenomenal in yeah. certain places. So it, it's hard to say, but if I had to nail down a time like to answer your question, I would say probably from the holidays right on through the early part of March is my favorite time to fish, yeah. right in the dead of winter. That's awesome. Just for the simple fact of you know, there's not a ton going on that time of year. Thankfully, this year we had pretty good trout fishing um, through that time of year, and it's still been good on those warmer days. But I mean, so many people are looking to. Uh, go fish that time of year i feel like a lot of people you know start to forget about fishing that time of year and then it takes those warmer days to fire you back up but but remember i mean this is this is such a great fishery that north Carolina's got to offer and um yeah it's it's crazy it's i, I wish we had that more here i mean I, I hear stories of what our, our our striper uh fishery used to be like here in the cape fear i think it was something like you know maybe 60 years ago that it was like top four migrations on the east coast have you ever heard anything like that yeah, I've heard I've heard some good stories about how good it used to be, and I mean things change over time. I mean, I mean the Roanoke fishery might not be this this good 30, 40, 50 years from now. Who knows? And right. maybe the Cape Fear will, will gain regain some of its former glory. I hope it does. I think through some restoration efforts, uh, opening that river up some more will help out a lot. Um, but we'll see. I mean, I think there's been some good things done down your way to try to try to revitalize that population. There has been, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, we had such a big kill from uh, Florence, but we, we've seen it. Like last year was, was – I didn't even fish for him last year. It was just so terrible. Um, you know, you're going out all day for one or two bites. And I've had some buddies this year that have gone out and caught, you know, 10, 15 fish um, on a, in a trip, and, and that that's good to hear. So. Um, and those are nice. Some of those are nice fish too. Yeah, like they are really nice, nice fish. fish. There's a lot less little guys, yeah. and um, that that was another question I've had. So, you know, there's a lot of people. You hear guys say, "Oh, you know, there's no big striper um, in that river system. Or it's hard to catch big striper in that river system." What do you feel, or what, what's your answer to that? Well, we've got we, we, we've got a we've got a fish factory. I mean, it just turns it turns out fish like crazy, and we have a lot of of like three and four year old fish, you know, like one to three year old fish, one, sorry, one to four or five year old fish, okay. you know, in that, you know, little, little guy range all the way up to about 25 inches. And then we have, we have a few of those big spawners that come into spawn in the springtime. So we got lots of little guys and we've got a few of the really, really large older fish. What we're missing is the ones that are like 25 inches to 35 inches. Yeah. And there's no reason in the world why we shouldn't be catching more of those fish, more of those 10, 15, 20 pound fish. And the reason why they're not there is because they're getting caught in the Albemarle Sound. Gotcha. They're getting caught. They're getting caught in the in the commercial the commercial quota. Yeah. There's 160, I, I, and I don't quote me on this number, but there's 160 some thousand pound commercial quota in the Albemarle Sound. That's where those fish are going. Is they're it, just not simply they're, – they're not, they're not making it to age 7, age 6, age 7, and 8, yeah. 10. You know, the, the few that do, they, they, they migrate out, uh, join the uh, adult population. But if, if, if that – I firmly believe that if we didn't have that quota in place, um, we would, ha- we would be, be routinely catching 15, 20-pound fish. Wow. 
in, in the river. In the I've river. never even really thought about that because you, you, I, I just fish for those fish when they're in the river, and I know they go in the sound, but I never thought about the commercial pressure, um, you know, on those fish. Now, do you feel like because I know there's so many pound nets. The couple times I fished out more sound, there's so many pound nets, but um, do you, what do you feel like is doing the most damage to those fish? And I know this is kind of a political discussion, but but if you don't, if you want to talk about it, awesome. If not, no worries. Well, I mean, there's there's not there's not nearly as many pound nets as there used to be in the Alamo Sound, and of course, the few that are left, they're catching some stripers, but but the gillnet fishery's probably taking care of most of them. Yeah, I mean, there there are a lot of pound nets in the eastern Alamo Sound, but I'm not sure if they even some of the guys set them for stripers, some of them don't. I think a lot of the, a lot of those uh, pound nets are set for flounder. It's set for flounder, okay. So I'm not really even sure. Yeah, I'm not really even sure when they when they when they when they put the nets up, but. Uh, yeah, you'd have to look that up, but yeah. Uh, but yeah, man, these, a lot of these fish are, you know, when they reach that size, are are, are not making it, and yeah. so we need more, we need more age, age structure and diversity within the stock, and if we had that, it, I mean, yeah, the only reason why we have so many fish is because it just keeps churning out baby fish every year. I mean, every year we have a good spawn, there's just more and more babies being born, and we, I mean, it's definitely a fish factor. There's no doubt about it, but we we really what we need is more stratified age groups within the stock yeah definitely and 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 there is some concern among certain people about that right now yeah i will say that what what do you uh or or what size do they have to be to start spawning like successfully spawning i mean most of your spawners are like you know when they get up in you know age four and five when they get up in their you know 20 20 inches and above especially you know 23 24 25 inch fish that's going to be, they grow about six inches a year, so that's going to be about a four-year-old fish, okay. roughly. And that is yeah. that is the, you know, the size class that, that we're missing. So it's, uh, you, the fishing's already insane, but I mean, I guess imagine if we had all those fish still returning to the river each year and spawning, it would be even better. It would be better. It would be even more, even more insane. But you, you don't have, you're not going to have a productive spawn every year up on the spawning grounds. You're going to have, uh, you know, years where the water's not quite right up there you're gonna it's gonna be too high or too low for a really really super productive spawn uh or the wor- one of the worst things that can happen is if you have a uh, an early summer tropical storm so it's like all these all these uh fertilized eggs hatch in the fry and they're down da- they, you know they're in the river you get you get a flood and what will happen is the uh a lot of the fry will get pushed out into the swamps or even worse a lot of that that swamp water that doesn't have any oxygen in it gets flushed out into the river channel. It can kill those little fry. Really? So it can, it can cause a fit. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's happened. Uh, you know, if you get like a June, one of these 20 inch rains in June, which, which we've seen before, it doesn't happen every year. Thank goodness. But that can be, uh, that can wipe out almost an entire age class. Golly. Yeah. I, 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 I no, I've heard about, you know, the, the floods hurting those fish and, flushing them around a little bit but i didn't realize you know the lower oxygen water getting in there was such a big deal that's crazy yeah it's uh we've got a lot of stuff in north carolina to 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 fix you know i I don't want to be the state that you know has to explain to their kid or i don't want to be the dad that has to explain to my kids like oh you know we used to be able to go out and catch a bunch of redfish here but we're taking too many and now we can't but it's sad you know it's it's easy to take from a resource where you can't see the you know you can't see all the fish in the water or the, or the, you know, the, the change of the amount of fish there. So, um, I just urge people to, to be cautious of, of that, you know, and, and voice their opinions. But yeah, that's uh thanks for sharing that. That's, that's really interesting. And that's uh I always like the scientific side of these talks, like understanding people's fisheries and their, you know, their, that, that whole, whole deal. But, um, well, cool. So we're, I think we're at 45 minutes here and the first one was, before we cut off was about 15 minutes. So we got a little bit more time. If, if you think there was anything else you wanted to share, any, any strategy, any uh, encouragement, anything like that? Well, I, I mean, I have a lot of people who, um, you know, that I, they fish with me and then they go back and try to do it, do it, them, you know, on their own. And, and, and they just, they get frustrated. They're like, you know, I went to the spots where you took me or something like that. Or, you know, I went to all my best spots and, and, and they weren't there that day. And what they don't realize is those fish, they just, they just, they don't realize how much those fish move from day to day. Cause I, I mean, I get to see it cause I'm out there every day, but they're not in the same spot a lot of times from day to day, maybe more than maybe two or three days at a time at the most. Yeah. I mean, and, 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 you know, a guy who fishes, you know, every Saturday 
it's going to be a completely different scenario every time he goes. Yeah. And so I guess what I can tell people to do is not get so focused on fishing spots and learning how to. And this is I teach this in my seminars and you know for all kind of fishing. Don't be a spot fisherman. Be a learn how to find fish. Learn learn how to learn how to solve the puzzle and to figure out where the fish are on that day that you're fishing. And if you if you develop that tool set, then you'll you'll be a lot more consistent fisherman. If you just go out with a mentality, I'm just going to go spot A, B, C, and D, and if I don't find them, I'm going home. Well, that doesn't do any do any good because right. you, just because you just because you caught them there one time under certain conditions doesn't mean they're going to be there again on different conditions. Yeah. Uh, they're probably not going to be if the conditions are different. So um, you just have to you have to be willing to to really ask yourselves a lot of questions and and try to develop patterns and and that that's really fishing fishing and the essence of fishing is learn how to pattern locations based on conditions. Yeah, definitely. And, and if you can and if you can do that, then then you'll be able to go out there under under all kinds of conditions and and, and find fish. Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, that that's a good point. Um, fish, fish for the fish, not the spot. Um, it, that's, I had a, I had a really good point I was going to say, but, but yeah, that, that, that's so important. I, I see that in every fish with speckled trout, redfish, these striper. Um, it's so easy to just go back to the same spot over and over again, but, um, you know, changing it up if it's not working. How long do you like to give a spot? Like say you go somewhere, you're marking fish, you see fish there. Um, and, and, but it's not, it's not like, how long are you going to camp out on the spot before you decide, oh, this isn't worth it. I'm moving. I mean, I'll make like probably ten casts and then leave. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I'll, I'll have everybody cast two or three, four times a piece, and then, and then as long as as long as the, the execution's there, as long as they're bouncing the bottom, and as long as the baits are getting where they need to go, where I need where I need them to be, if we're not getting bit, I'm out of there. Like, yeah. I mean, I might I might fish thirty or forty different places in a day. Yeah, and I run and gun. I run and gun hard. Uh, so that's another piece of advice I could give you, like. If you're not getting bit in the area, don't don't stay there very long. Yeah. And a lot, but a lot, but a lot of these places that I stop are just small little spots. You know, they're just small little little areas. You know, where where I might mark them or where I think they might be, and then I then I look on my sonar and they're there. Um, so, you know, just don't spend too much time in a place if you're not getting bit. Yeah, for sure. But but it, but but there's not there's nothing more gratifying than 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 going to an area and seeing the fish and making that first cast. And bam, there he is, and you sit there and just wear him out. Yeah. I, mean, I love. I, I I have days. I have I have days. I love the days where where we go to a spot, and you know the the first place I picked out to start, and and I and I grab the rod and I go, okay, y'all, this is how to do it. You know, just make the cast. You know, jig the bait, let it fall to the bottom, and bam, I get a bite, and I'm like, well, I can't really demonstrate any better than that. He go, here's the rod. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. it, it, but that 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 fishery is that that fishery is that good you can do that when it, when they're really stacked up and uh so that i mean that's that's the that's the whole appeal of the fishery is that 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 um kind of that the chance of that triple digit day yeah and 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 it, and it happens more often than it doesn't happen usually i mean i i would say at least half our trips we probably you know we're close to that 100 fish mark if not over wow. uh but a lot of our a lot of our trips we catch between 40 and 50 fish and 100 fish uh and then there's you know maybe a third of our trips might be you know 15 to 50 fish yeah so, yeah still um, an excellent day and as far as still a good goes. day yeah <laughs> still a very good day yeah. i mean you go out there and bang, bang out 25 stripers that are 22 20 18 to 22 inches i mean that's on on light spinner rods that's that's a great day yeah for sure for sure uh, i'll take that day right now for sure. <laughs> but, um, well, cool. Well, if people want to reach out to you and, and book a trip or, or pick your brain, but mostly, uh, if they want to come, you know, come fishing with you, how can they find you? Well, uh, there's, I have a ton of information on my website, www.tarpamguide.com. I have a whole page devoted to this fishery on there and winter striper fishing. Um, just read about it. Some of it might put you to sleep. Some of it may interest you. So but just give me a, give, give me a call, shoot me an email. All my information is on there and I'm happy to help. Awesome. Yeah. And your Instagram is the, I've got it on here, but for anybody listening, it's tar Pam guide. So if you want to follow him on Instagram, keep up with his pictures, be jealous uh, all week long while he's posting pictures of striper tar Pam guides where you can follow him. But yeah, thanks so much, man, for coming on. It's always a pleasure 
Sorry again about the technical difficulties. Ooh. I am not Billy. Billy's a good good at uh, setting all that stuff up. I'm not so. <laughs> well, I think that was probably my, my my backwoods internet over here. That was on my end. So yeah, I been, forgive you, but man, you've been good. But I, man, good. I, but I, I appreciate you having me, and um, uh, and look, look forward to doing it again sometime. For sure, man. For sure. Well, I'm going to close the show out here. Let me switch over, guys. Thanks for tuning in. Sorry again about those technical difficulties. Um, it, you know, we were overdue. It was time that, that we got the show, uh, dropped due to bad internet and it's probably going to happen again. You know, hopefully it won't, but it probably will. Uh, thanks for, for watching the show, you guys. And, and again, you'll be able to see this on the podcast platforms as well as YouTube. I'm going to do a little post editing on this one to kind of stitch it together, hopefully since it dropped us. And, uh, like I said, even now you can share this broadcast on your Facebook page, which really helps us, um, kind of, kind of grow this community. Head on over and follow Eastern Current Fishing, or actually join Eastern Current Fishing, which is the the new fishing group where we can all kind of talk talk about you know tactics and share reports and uh, ask questions. It's, it'll just hopefully be a, a fun place for everybody to interact with each other that enjoys watching this show. Uh, as always, thanks for watching, and I will see you in episode thirty seven next week. Actually, I won't see. I won't be live. It's going to be a pre recorded episode. I'm going to be down in the keys with my wife, hanging out. So enjoy that episode, and I will see y'all soon. Later. <laughs>